Welcome to Koine Collectors. This is the new channel which is about translating Koine Greek, which is mainly going to be Biblical Greek. Um, I'll tell you about myself in a moment, as we can see from the map, which I don't own the copyright to, and I didn't draw or get a photo map from. Uh, this is the vague distribution of Koine Greek that existed in uh, probably the Roman times. And we'll talk about the history of where Koine Greek actually came from. Obviously, we can actually see from the map there that it is distributed more than just in what we now consider modern Greece. And in fact, the concept of Greece and the ancient world may well, well have been those places where Greek was actually spoken um, as a majority language. By the way, the word Greek actually comes from Latin doesn't come from Greek and um, the classical Greeks called their own land um, or lands they called them Hellas which in modern Greek is Elas. All right so it's a new channel I think we've established that. Okay my name is Cousin Leonid and I'm going to be talking to you about this. And just out of interest, I mainly deal with classical Greek. That's Greek mainly from the, the 5th century, possibly a little bit earlier, possibly a little bit later. But it is a little bit different from what we've got. So it's about well, a couple of centuries earlier than what you find in the New Testament in the Bible, for example or from inscriptions in Alexandria and things of that kind. All right, first of all, Biblical Greek. So it's also known as Alexandrian Greek or Alexandrian dialect, Hellenistic Greek, and sometimes Common Attic. So the historical reason behind this is that um, Alexander the Great, so in the 4th century BC, when he went and conquered the Persian Empire, which was probably as much of a surprise to him as it was to anyone else. He suddenly had this vast territory which he needed to rule, and they were invaders. They were different people. Um, so there were Macedonians and there were Greek people in the army as well. And what happened increasingly as was that as a method of controlling the places further east, but also controlling the places back in Greece, you actually took people, colonists, so people who are willing to start a new life, um, into the lands of the east where they took the lands which belonged to people who were already there. So they took it over and naturally they continued to speak Greek. Now these Greek colonies were founded as far as Afghanistan, and that happened over a very large amount of time. It didn't happen uh, just in the time of Alexander the Great. It was in fact a continuing policy, and it was one that was taken up by the Seleucids, who later ruled in Syria, and from time to time into Persia and into Afghanistan. Okay, so Alexandrian Greek, or Alexandrian dialect, that doesn't just have to do with Alexander the Great. It has to do with the city that he founded in um, Egypt, which, wonderful choice for a city name, was Alexandria. That's not egotistical at all. So he actually founded that, and it was there was already a large Greek population in Egypt, which were largely there for mercantile reasons. But it was interest, in the interest of the 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 Greco-Macedonian kings, the Ptolemies, to actually have Greek as the language of governance. And in fact, just out of interest, um, only Cleopatra, the very last of the rulers, and there were other Cleopatras, we're just talking about the, the famous Cleopatra, um, who later married Mark Antony, um, only she learnt um, the the Egyptian language. Okay, so 
Where does it come from? Well, obviously, Koine Greek wasn't a completely new language. It's just a development that occurred from classical Greek, and it's not really that hard to imagine. So it's just like if we take English, we have English and we have Middle English and we have Old English. Probably the difference between classical Greek and Koine Greek was the difference between uh, Middle English and, and Modern English. Uh, certainly not as far back as Old English, which is very different indeed. And in fact, if we wanted to have that kind of difference, we probably have to go back to uh, Linear B Greek in, say, the 14th and 13th centuries BC, which were very different indeed. But that is going to be something we're not focusing on at all. I'll leave it for a different channel. All right, so when we talk about classical Greek, we're really talking about a number of different dialects, and the main dialect was Attic Greek. When we talk about dialect, we mean people who speak the same language, but there's enough local variation to make it sometimes difficult to understand. So if we take in various ancient, uh, ancient works, I'm thinking Aristophanes, who was an Athenian, in his texts, um, he often laughs at people who come from Thebes or come from Sparta because of the different way that they have of speaking. So most of the time when we're talking about classical Greek, we are talking about Attic Greek. And that will be, for example, Euripides, who writes plays, wrote plays. Uh, he's dead by a long way. Uh, Xenophon, who wrote a history, a very fine history. Um, and also um, people like Demosthenes who wrote legal speeches. Now we have people in later generations such as Plutarch who actually write in a style which is not far off what would have been written in, in the 5th century, but it was considered very, very archaic. So I suppose it is not unlike um, someone these days trying to write like Shakespeare or Jane Austen or someone. Okay, there was also Ionic dialect, and there are a fair few examples of that. Main ones include Herodotus, the great historian, sometimes called the founder of history, and there was also Hippocrates, and um, if you read some authors, they talk about how Ionic was more flexible for writing things in, but I'm not sure how you can actually say that. But they're more experts in that than I am. And then there were other dialects such as Aeolic, which um, the good poetess Sappho wrote in. And um, you can read Sappho, she's well worth reading. It is, however, very, very difficult for us to read if we are just trained in Attic Greek, or even in Attic and Ionic Greek, Aeolic Greek is very, very different, and it's very hard to, to read without having a commentary and a dictionary right next to you. And the last one we mentioned there is Eleatic. So we have the philosopher Parmenides, so in the 6th century BC, and he actually came from southern Italy, what we call southern Italy. So uh, there were Greeks who lived in southern Italy. It wasn't a single country at that time in the 6th century BC. And that is something that we can leave for another time to talk about. All right. So there is some good news. So one of the two of the major differences between Koine Greek and Classical Greek are the things which Koine Greek does not have. And I think we can actually be happy about this rather than feel disappointed. The first one is that there was no middle voice. Now I'll just explain this very briefly because we're not going to have to worry about it. So in many languages, I'm not going to say all languages, because definitely not, but in many languages, and most Indo-European languages, there was an active and a passive, and there still is, I suppose. And the active is something does happen, such as I touch the table. The passive is often talking about the same action, but it's talking about it from a different perspective. So the table was touched by me. 
So it's exactly the same action, but we're focusing on it from a different perspective. And you might have occasionally been tearing your hair out when on Microsoft Word, and when you're doing a spell check, it tells you, oh, you've just written something in the passive. Wouldn't you prefer to write that in the active? And you can utter a variety of words in a variety of dialects. Okay, and there is also the dual. And what we mean by the dual there, just ignore the um, the picture. The only thing that's relevant in the picture is that there are two of them, and that's our clue. So there is a singular and there is a plural, and there are in many languages. Again, I'm not going to say all. In classical Greek, however, and for that matter, Sanskrit, Sanskrit does this for both the middle voice and the the jewel again that will be for another another channel uh, not for this one uh, then there are three numbers there's a singular there is the plural we know those and then there is the jewel which only refers to two of something and that two of something has to be intimately related to each other so we're talking two gods who always go together, or a married couple of gods, or for that matter, just a married couple of people, or a father and a son, or a mother, or a daughter, okay, something like that. But the good news is we don't have to worry about that in Koine Greek. We do not have to worry. So let's go on. So the New Testament is written in Koine Greek. Now, whether Jesus spoke Koine Greek or not, we just do not know. And there are a variety of rather um, erudite articles which talk about what language Jesus might have actually spoken. And there's some speculation he might have actually spoken Greek because there's one passage of the New Testament which says that Jesus is not going to change one iota of the law. And we are soon going to see that iota um, is a letter in uh, classical Greek and a very small one at that. So that basically was meaning he was saying he was not going to change it at all. So the Synoptic Gospels, those are Mark, Matthew and Luke, or Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, it is theorized they come from a third gospel or there's a third gospel that is um, the same level as Mark. Now, Matthew, Mark and Luke are definitely in Koine Greek, but there is a theory that can't be substantiated. We don't even know if the Q gospel actually existed, that the Q gospel was in some other language, perhaps Aramaic or an early form of, of Syriac or, or something of that kind. But again, that's not really going to worry us because we're just translating what we have rather than bothering with what we don't. So it's something that will be very interesting, but until we have it, we're not going to worry about it. All right, for the channel and this first podcast or video or whatever we call it, uh, which, by the way, is in very low resolution. That's because there's not a great deal to see. I haven't got a fantastically animated 3D introduction. I haven't got a, a beautiful tune at the end. I did have one that I wanted to play, but it was apparently under copyright. I had considered humming a few bars of Bartok, but I was convinced not to. All right, so the ground rules for both me and you... Okay, and they're not going to be too serious. Okay, one, uh, no agendas by me. So I'm not doing this as a Bible study. I'm not trying to teach you theology. And I'm not the person to teach you theology. I have my own ideas, but they're my own ideas, and I would rather not share them or get flamed for them. Okay, so there are definitely no agendas. Um, I'm not making this for any particular group, so everyone is more than welcome. So if you're interested in learning about language, well, this is the right place. And we are going to be talking about religious matters, but 
just as far as translation goes. So I'm not trying to make anyone feel unwelcome or uncomfortable. And please forgive me if I do. I'm saying that in advance, but I hope I don't. Okay, all right. In advance, I'd also like to say that I'm not going to do anything on the clobber verses. So the clobber verses are those verses in both the New and the Old Testament. I'm not touching the Old Testament at all, which are on same-sex unions. So I'm not doing that because I don't want to start a massive flame war. And I, I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. Okay, and I'm sure that you can find that in other places on the internet. And by the same token, I'm not going to read um, any verses about the role of women in the church. This is something that you can look at for yourselves. And there are two broad um, ideas about what they are, the complementarians and the egalitarians. But you can look up that for yourselves and they would have a summary of, of the Greek in both cases. All right, listen to your professors and lecturers. Okay, so if ever I say anything on these videos, podcasts, which goes against what you've been taught in class, please listen to your professors and lecturers. Okay, they are going to be marking your papers. They are going to be setting the exams. So you do not want to antagonize them by... I may say something that disagrees with them. Okay, just go with what they say. Okay, I, I think that would be the path of least resistance. Okay, and they have a difficult enough life what with marking and so forth without having some person on YouTube telling them that they're wrong, which I'm not. Okay, pronunciation. Please don't criticize mine. So obviously I'm Australian. Uh, Australian, so if I pronounce the Greek in a way that is not to your liking, please don't flame me for that. Um, and by the way, it is guaranteed, it is just guaranteed, that if you're a speaker of modern Greek, we are going to pronounce the words differently. And I am sorry in advance for that. So I have Greek relatives, they hate my pronunciation, that is okay, I understand, but please don't bother me with comments on that. All right. These videos are made in my own time and will take quite a bit of it. However, rather than donate any money to me, because I don't need it, I would prefer that if you felt the need or if you felt thankful in some way for something that I did, and I would be incredibly grateful for that, that you give a donation to a charitable fund. Okay. There are just plenty out there, um, which are very great causes, and you can donate to something which you think is worthwhile. But any suggestions would be something like children in need, animals in need, reforestation, uh, women who are victims of domestic violence, people who are victims of war. Okay, I'll leave it totally up to you and... Um, Actually, ignore that bit there. You don't have to mention it in the comments, and it might be best if you don't. So um, just have a think about that. Okay, and last of all, um, always be kind to everyone. So if you're going to make a comment, you feel absolutely need to the need to make a comment, please be kind to me, because I'll don't have a great deal of time to read everything. I will, if there is an earnest question that needs to be answered, I will put, try and answer it. Um, but try not to flame someone else for asking something that you don't particularly like. And by the same token, um, if there are any trolls, just don't feed them. <laughs>